Good every evening, everybody. And my name is Josh, uh, the chair of CPIC, and we'll be starting our presentation, Parenting into the Teen Years, in about two minutes. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. We'll be starting in about one minute with our presentation, Parenting into the Teen Years. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another webinar offered by Halton CPIC. My name is Josh Davistein, and I'm the chair of CPIC. Along with me online are CPIC members Rosemary Stagg and Barb Belanger. Before I introduce the speakers for tonight, who are presenting tonight on Parenting into the Teen Years, I'd like to make you aware of the following. This webinar is being recorded, and like our previous webinars, will be available in several languages in a few days on our YouTube page under Halton CPIC. Questions to the presenters or technical questions can be posed in the questions tab that you see on your screen. Technical questions will be answered during the presentation by us as best as we can. Questions to the presenters will be saved up and Barb will ask them at the end of both presentation, time permitting. Let me introduce the speakers for tonight. First presenter is out of two is Cheryl Despoth. She is a public health nurse with Halton Region Health Department's School Years Program. She has been a registered nurse for 26 years and has worked for the last 15 years in various roles with public health. Currently, Cheryl works with school staff, students and parents in North Halton to promote a healthy environment and behavior to help kids thrive. Cheryl is an accredited practitioner of Triple P, the Positive Parenting Program, and is a certified trainer in developmental assets. She's also mem a member of Halton's Our Kid Network Transitions to High School Committee. Cheryl is the parent of two teenage boys and admits that parenting can be a challenging journey, but has been pleased to discover that one of the most rewarding experiences, experiences in parenting has been watching her boys grow and mature throughout their teen years. Our second presenter is Cynthia Lindsay. She works as a public health nurse with the School Years Program. She has been nursing for over 20 years, with the last 10 years focused on parenting. Throughout this time, she has worked with parents who have had kids that span the ages of 0 to 18 years. She's now focused on the transition years of 10 to 15 years old. She works daily on parenting topics and researches best practices and frameworks. Cynthia has many parenting accreditations, and enjoys connecting with parents in the community through Triple P, parenting groups, and social media. She is a blog writer and is active on Facebook and Twitter for Halton Parents. Cynthia also speaks French and loves working, making connections, and raising her teen son and preteen daughter with her husband in Halton. So without much further ado, here are the presenters. 
Thanks so much, Josh, and thank you, parents, for joining us tonight um, for Parenting into the Teen Years. Cynthia and I are really happy to have this opportunity tonight to share some positive parenting strategies with you. These strategies have been shown through research to be able to help your child transition into adolescence so, that the, so they will be able to develop positive relationships, build strong decision-making skills, and avoid risky behaviors into their teen years. So before we begin, I'd just like to highlight the Halton Parents logo at the top of the slide. And Halton Parents is a health department resource uh, staffed by public health nurses. And we've got lots of information on our website and through our various social media sites on parenting, child growth and development, different health issues, um, behavior. So if you have any questions after tonight's presentation, um, please feel free to log on to any of our resources or follow us on our social media sites and I'll be providing that contact information at the end of the presentation tonight. We will have about an hour to present tonight and then we'll have some time for questions after that. So on the agenda tonight we'd like to share a brief overview of typical adolescent behavior and the teen brain. Sorry, we just need to advance the slide, having a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, we'll share the five key parenting strategies and we'll provide some practical tips to help your child transition into adolescence. And these strategies and tips will also help you to strengthen your relationship with your team. And we'll also highlight some resources that will prepare you and your team for that transition to high school. So when we talk about transition to adolescence tonight, we're referring to the time period between about age 10 and about age 15. So if you think of your average 9 or 10 year old, perhaps you have one at home, um, you think of a 9 or 10 year old normally as a small child, they're sweet and affectionate and happy and full of energy, they're mostly dependent on their parents and they usually love to be around their parents. Now, if you think about the average teenager who's about 15 or 16 years old, you probably conjure up a different image. Um, you see a much older child, more adult size, so they may not even look like a child anymore. They may be much more independent. They may not be quite as affectionate or sweet and loving as they were when they were younger. Um, and sometimes with teenagers, it seems like all they want to do is eat and sleep and hang out with their friends. So we know that there's a whole lot that's happening between the ages of 10 and the ages of 15. And sometimes you may even look at your child during these adolescent years and you might not even recognize your own child because the changes seem to be happening so quickly. So when the children are going through their adolescent period, they're having multiple changes in their physical appearance and their body, they're having lots of emotional changes, they're developing intellectually, and they're developing socially. And during this transition time, not only does your child go through a lot of changes, but your parenting is also going through a lot of changes. You'll, you may find that parenting approaches that you tried and you used very effectively when your child was younger, maybe they're not working anymore now that your child is a tween or a teen. So this can be a really challenging and emotional time for parents. And we just want to reassure you tonight that it's absolutely normal to feel overwhelmed and unsure during these adolescent years. And we hope that the tips that we're going to share with you tonight are going to help you through your journey as a parent. So we know that um, children are all very different. They all come with different personalities. They all develop at different rates. Boys develop very differently than girls, but in general there are several typical adolescence behaviors that we see with, with kids. And one of the first changes um, that parents often see when their child is entering their tween years is the changes in mood. So there's lots of changes with puberty and hormones, there's lots of things going on in the teen brain which we'll be talking about in a few minutes. But all these changes can cause extreme mood swings for children or for older children. So you may have a daughter who's um, had a fight with her best friend and she's crying and she's upset and she's never going to talk to this friend again and you're just struggling to try and figure out how you can support your daughter. And then an hour later you hear your daughter talking on the phone and she's laughing and chatting and she's talking to the same friend 
end, and now they're BFFs again. So then you're completely flabbergasted. So we know from one minute to the next, moods can change. From one day to the ne to the next day, their moods can change. I know in my house with two teenage boys, um, something as simple as a request to unload the dishwasher can send my son off into an eye angry tirade about how unfair life is and how his brother doesn't have to do as much work as he does around the house. And then if I ask him another day to unload the dishwasher, exact same request, but I'll get an answer like, sure mom, no problem. So you just never quite know what you're going to get with um, a teen. Um, one thing I have learned, I'll share just a bit of wisdom to those parents who are going through the teenage years. I ha in my house anyway, I've learned to predict the time of day, what their moods may be like. So I know if I ask a question or try and have a conversation in the morning, I'm likely to get met with an angry grunt. Whereas if I try and engage my son in conversation in the afternoon when he's much more rested, he's much more likely to give me a pleasant response. So that's just something that works in our house. Um, in addition to the mood changes, there's a lot of changes going on in their body. Again, they're going through puberty. They're having huge growth spurts and rapid physical change. Uh, I think one of my sons must have gained probably about an inch a day as he went through grade nine. Um, because of all these physical and emotional, or sorry, um, brain brain changes and growth, they are needing more sleep. So teenagers need about nine to 10 hours of sleep a night. And a lot of teens have difficulty falling asleep at night because their melatonin levels are actually a little bit lower. Or they choose to stay up at night because they want to hang out with their friends or they want to listen to music or do other things that they enjoy doing. But staying up at night means they want to sleep in later in the morning. And so that quite often makes it very difficult for teens to get up in the morning and get going and concentrate at school and function really well. It's also quite normal with teens to show some increased risk-taking behavior. So it's normal for them to want to experience new things and push the boundaries, and that's great because it's a way of developing their independence. Um, they often tend to focus, though, on the present, and it's really hard for them to see the long-term consequences of their actions. So this can lead them to make what we as adults would sometimes consider poor decisions because they're not able to see what the outcomes of their actions are going to be. Um, teens quite often spend less time with their family and more time with their friends. And they often also show less affection to their parents. So that young child that used to run up to you and give you hugs and kisses, they might stop approaching you in that way as they get into their tween and their teen years. And if a parent tries to go and give their child a hug or a kiss, they might find that their child feels, um, seems very uncomfortable or is very embarrassed, especially if they're around their friends. And the last um, thing that quite often happens in adolescence is there are lots of changes in self-confidence and self-esteem. And that's something that we all struggle with periodically during our lives, but it's especially true for teens when they're trying to figure out who they are and where they fit into the world. So on this next slide, you may recognize some of the pictures or some of the quotes, like, you're the best mom ever, but I hate you or you don't understand me, or I'm not listening to you. So the most important thing for you to know as the parent of a teen is that your teen still needs you into the teen years, despite how they may seem like they're not listening or despite how they may push you away at times. There's been a lot of research done in this area around teen behavior and parenting during the teen years. And what research has shown is that the parents are the, still the most important influence in their teen's life. The literature also shows that teens want and need support and close relationships with their parents. When teens are asked about what they need from their parents, they overwhelmingly say that they want their mom and dad involved. So adolescence isn't a time to step back and where you um, reduce your support and guidance Got, sorry, your support and guidance as a parent. They really need you. So definitely your role as a parent of a teen is changing. You're going from doing for them 
to supporting them to do for themselves. One of your main goals as a parent is to help your child grow up and develop into a healthy, responsible, and independent individual. And in order to do that, we need to allow them greater independence, we need to allow them to problem solve and make good decisions for themselves. So um, the Search Institute, which you may have heard about, is an organization in the United States and it focuses on positive youth development and they've done a lot of research. And what they have found is that when parents are involved with their youth, the tweens and teens are more likely to do well in school, they're more likely to enjoy being at home with their family, they have a more positive peer group and they're more likely to be resilient and be able to cope with all life's ups and downs. And also when parents are involved, young people are less likely to engage in those high risk behaviors like using alcohol or drugs, and they're less likely to have a mental health crisis. So um, I've put the link for the Search Institute at the bottom of the slide. If you're interested in hearing or learning more about uh, the research that's been done around parent involvement and why it's important and why child and parent relationships are so key, there's also a lot of information on the Search Web Institute. They've done a um, website. They've done a lot of work on developmental assets and family assets. And these are the qualities and experiences that help young people and their families thrive. So I'd encourage you to check out that website when you have a chance. So just before Cynthia goes on to talk about the strategies and tips for parents, I'd just like to give a brief overview of what's going on in the teen brain. And understanding what's going on in the teen brain isn't meant to excuse the teen's behavior. It's just to help the parents kind of be able to relate to what they're going through and also to help them cope with some of those what we might think of as irrational behaviors and it's also to help guide your team through those teen years. So one of the most important things to know is that a child's brain is still developing up until the age of 25. So essentially the brain is still under construction. And that term under construction was coined by Dr. Jean Clinton who is a parenting expert and there's a link below to the Our Kids Network site, which has videos um, where Dr. Clinton is talking about the teen brain and some of those strategies to um, help parents cope with, through that period. So for our purposes tonight, we're going to show a very simplistic view of the brain. There's a lot more going on than it looks like in our di diagram here. But essentially in the teen brain, there's two sides at work. There's the emotional side and there's the rational side. And remember that they're not fully developed in the teenager and that connection between the two sides it also is not fully developed. So the emotional brain, which is at the back, it develops first and it governs a teen's thinking and behavior. The emotional brain gets excited by taking risks and th seeking thrilling experiences. The frontal lobe of the brain, the rational brain, develops later and it's responsible for reasoning. The rational brain helps with planning, organizing, controlling impulses and self-awareness. Now because the emotional brain is leading a teen's thinking, kids can sometimes make irrational choices. They engage in more risky behavior because the emotional side is taking over and leading them. Since the rational brain isn't fully developed, the teens have a hard time seeing the consequences of their behavior. So to see a really good demonstration of how the teen brain works, all you need to go do is go onto the YouTube channel or watch America's Funniest Videos and you'll see thousands of clips of teenage boys. And I say boys because the rational part of their brain develops a little more slowly than it does for girls. So you'll see lots of video clips of things like boys riding their bike really fast up a ramp and doing a flip and landing in a lake. Or they'll be doing things like jumping off the roof of the house onto a trampoline. So it's easy for us as adults to look at that and say, what are you thinking? Do you not understand that that's dangerous and that you shouldn't be doing that? Um, but all the teen is thinking about is, wow, that's 
going to be so cool, I need to do it now because they're being driven by that emotional brain and the rational part of their brain, which should be saying stop and think about it, is really kind of taking a back seat. So it's a really tough balance for a parent because you want your children to experience new opportunities and you want them to become more independent and you want them to learn from their mistakes as long as they're not catastrophic mistakes. Um, but you also want them to recognize that their actions have consequences and high-risk behavior can be dangerous. So sometimes the parent has to step in and be that rational part of the brain for their team. So again, this was a really simple overview of the brain. Uh, for more information, you can go to the Our Kids website, which is listed, and check out Dr. Clinton's videos. There have also been two really good webinars done for CPIC, and they are on CPIC's website, and the link for that is posted here as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to Cynthia to talk about the five key strategies for parents. Okay, great. Thanks, Cheryl. So uh, what we did here is we took all the, we reviewed all the literature, all the parenting programs, all the parenting philosophies, and we reviewed with regards to successful adults, what were the key components during the teen years that made them successful? So we came up with these five parenting actions from the literature review. Now reading them, you're gonna see them on the screen, be connected, stay involved, continue to monitor, be a good role model, and provide lots of support. So reading these key actions, you're probably thinking to yourself that there's nothing new, and you're absolutely correct. There is nothing new in these parenting actions. What is gonna change is how you do this with your teenager, how you do these parenting actions into the teen years. You really need to be intentional. So you can't let your relationship just happen. As Cheryl mentioned, Kids are pulling away and spending more time with their friends. So it's really important to stay connected during this time. It is actually possible to have a positive relationship with your teenager, believe it or not. Numerous studies, as Cheryl indicated, indicate that youth really do want and need their parents. They want them to be a steady force to help them with their new experiences and challenges, because this is all new for them. They're self-discovering and sometimes they're really unsure on what to do and where to go. So why are these actions so important? Well, everyone, when I go out, asks often, how do I get my kids not to drink alcohol? How do I get them not to smoke or do drugs or do any of these risky behaviors? And really, there's, there are programs out there and there are scare tactics, but the research also shows that if you show them a scare tactic, that it usually lasts about two weeks. So these programs are not effective long term. What, is what we do know that's effective is that it is the relationship that you have with your kids that will be the number one factor in reducing risky behavior. So that's why it's really important. It's really important to start being intentional with these actions because teens are going through emotional, social, physical changes and that really changes the family dynamics. So as parents, we need to adapt. We have to change how we parent our preteens and our teens. So now we're going to just take a few minutes to go through each one individually. So what is being connected? What does that mean? Well, it's really about your positive relationship. So when you have a positive relationship, it makes talking about anything a lot easier. So the more you talk, the more your relationship will grow. And you'll be, both be able to then talk about those really tough topics. So sometimes when you think you're just having a, a light conversation over dinner, that is actually building your relationship so that they can later come and feel comfortable to talk to you about some really tough situations that they're facing. It's about keeping that connection open. As a parent, you not only want to have that positive relationship with your child, but you need to be intentional with building it with their friends, their school, and the whole community. So it's being connected to your child, but with everything that affects your child as well. So let's talk a few minutes about how we can do this in the teen year. So what changes? What's different? Okay, so again, nothing new here, but just the way you're gonna do it is gonna be a little bit different. 
you're going to spend time together. So we see some teens playing games. I know sometimes uh, you might be looking, I could never get my, my teenager to sit and, and play games with me. But actually, if you sort of offer up um, it, an activity that everybody is interested in doing, then they're more likely to spend time with you. What you want to do is talk, spend time together, start a conversation in the car. So have them put their smart devices away, so their phone. So often they're sitting in the seat beside me. Just the other day, you know, my son was going off to Ottawa for his school trip, and he's playing on his phone. So it's sort of like, you know, let's have a rule in the car to put the phone away and just have that informal conversation. You need to be intentional about it. So these, con these conversations will help your children make healthy choices. You need to be clear about what your values are and why you have them. So you need to be clear about that as well. Kids can't resist negative peer pressure if they don't know what's right and wrong. So having this positive relationship will really help your teen listen. One thing that you want to do that we're sort of losing in today's society is that regular family meal. Turn the TV off. If there's one thing that you take away from today's presentation is to make sure that TV is off during family meals. Make them important. On weekends, you can be creative. You can actually have a regular breakfast or a regular lunch together. It doesn't always have to be dinner if your teen has plans, but at least have one meal a day together. If this is something you haven't done in a while, it might seem a little bit strange, but keep at it. Keep sticking with it. You'll notice all sorts of conversations coming out of that dinner table. Another thing that you want to do is have those fun family activities. So you don't always want to be you know, at your children with regards to unloading the dishwasher, or putting their clothes away, or cleaning their room. You want to have fun together. Don't forget to have fun together. Often when the kids are young, we take them to the park, and we really make sure that we have fun together. Somehow that sometimes gets lost in the teen years. And get everyone to pick one activity. Be committed to this. It could be a simple walk, or it could be um, everybody picking their own activity, whether they want to have a movie night, or they want to go for a bike ride, or it can be everybody picks an activity one a month, and it's something a little bit more in detail with regards to going zip lining or some, whatever's within your budget with regards to that. And the, we also want to try and keep at least two nights a week where there's no activities. I know this sounds a little bit foreign with regards to the society that we're living in with the go, 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 that we need to be involved in many extracurricular activities, but it's not always in the best interest of our kids. If you think about if we're looking at our preteens, our teens, and they're entering, you know, grade 8, grade 9, grade 10, you're looking at having, you know, maybe three or four years left at home as a family unit before they go off to college, university, or other or other jobs. So really this family time should be a priority. So really try and keep a few nights a week where you can spend time as a family. Even if it's just sitting in the same room, watching a program together, reading together, it's really important to have that family time together. We want to also have one-on-one -on -one time. So this can be with yourself, um, with each child. So this is one way that you can show affection. As Cheryl alluded earlier, showing affection becomes a lot different in the teen years. So spending time with them is a way of showing your affection. So even if it's not doing anything particularly simple, uh, anything particularly special, just spend some time together. Other things that can show your affection can be a simple pat on the back or a hug or a knock on the door before entering. All this shows affection, love, and respect to your teens. It's just a little bit different. And you also want to plug into their world. So get connected to your teen and youth's world. I know now there's all sorts of different programs that the teens are using, whether it's Instagram or Snapchat. Sit down and ask them what it's about. Have them show you. Join those, uh, the programs where your kids are at. It, uh, you know, it's one way for them to show you different things and be part of their world. And also the last point here on being connected is family meetings. So family meetings are important, but they don't need to be formalized. So if you're kind of thinking, oh, I, you know, sitting all, all around the table and having a formal meeting just isn't for our family. That's okay. It can be done over dinner. It can be um, less formal. It just gives everybody an opportunity to discuss different issues. So now we're going to move on to the second parenting action, and that's 
that's involvement. So involvement and being connected, they're very closely related. So we talked about being connected is about that relationship, the relationship that you have with your kids. Involvement is about more about how you are going to be involved in their lives. How are you going to actively engage with them? So yes, it's about keeping your relationship strong, but it's also about the strategies on how you can stay involved in their lives. Staying involved is a lot more difficult as kids age, as more and more time is being spent away from the family unit. Their friends are becoming very important, so is after school activities, and some might even be starting to have uh, small part-time jobs. So involvement is about finding ways to learn and know more about and take part in what's going on at home, at school, and in the surrounding community. Involvement includes parent actions to help their teens come to understand their purpose and set goals. So adolescents state that the most meaningful type of involvement from parents is involvement that allows them to gain an understanding for and appreciation of their goals and future planning. It's involvement that gives meaning to their lives. So how do we stay involved with our kids? What do we do? Number one thing is involve your teens in decision making. Make decisions together. So this is a change where earlier in the years, do as I say, and kids don't often have a lot of input into the decisions within the family unit. So now involve them. Teens are far more likely to listen if they have a say. So what happens if you're involving your teen in a decision making and you really don't like the options that your teen's choosing? That's okay. It's okay for you to say that option doesn't work for me because of this and you can state whatever values that you have. And then you keep talking about it and you come up with different solutions. So it's not saying that your teen will be the most important voice in the decision, but they need to be involved in some capacity. Talk about school, friends, and life. Talk, I think you'll hear that through every parenting action. Learn the names of their friends. Learn what's stressing them at school if there's a test coming up. Encourage your teen to be involved in school activities. Ask them what's going on. Often they're shy, especially in grade nine, to get involved. So really encourage them to, to try something new. Help them outline short and long-term goals. Help them plan to accomplishment, accomplish them. So if they're looking at perhaps you know, getting a part-time job, help them establish some goals, help them with a resume. You can help them achieve some of those. So you can also share your experiences. So when you were a teen, you can share some of your stories. But remember to listen as well, so you can and share, but just not until you've heard what they have to say. The next one is big two. Listen more and try not to overreact. Listen more than you talk and try not to overreact about what you're hearing. So often we want to solve their problems. So when they're coming to us with the issue of um, problems with their friendships, often we want to just jump in there with a solution and often that's not what they need from us. They simply need us to listen. Sometimes they just want to talk to you and you don't need to problem solve. You just need to listen. Encourage your teen to develop the solution. Ask them questions. So of course having said that, if you think there's danger, of course you should intervene at that point. But the majority of times, the fact that they're coming to you is a positive indication that you have that strong relationship. So help them problem solve but don't try and jump in too often with, with solutions for them. What you want to do is look at celebrating accomplishments and share disappointments. So sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. So life is a learning curve. If everything was perfect the first time, there'd be no opportunities for growth. And we know this is how we build resiliency. So focus on the effort. Recognize the dis disappointment. Don't trivialize it, but don't try to fix it either. What you want to do is show that you value, you also want to show that you value school and education. The more that parents value that, the more that it will encourage your children to value that as well. So have direct, regular contact with your child's teachers in the school. So often, Parents volunteer in the early years, and then once it comes to high school, 
it's really hard for people, for the high schools to find parent volunteers because their kids are telling them they don't want them involved in the school. But really you want to stay connected with the school in some way. This can even be through casual conversations. If you can help with school activities, uh, going to parent-teacher interviews, and getting involved with parent council are all other ways that you can stay involved with school. And just on the, the final note, you want to also make chores part of being involved. So not only do you want to be involved, but your child needs to be involved in the family and the family functioning. And a lot of that is contributing to the household chores. So it's important for them to contribute to the family and the family chores as well. Okay, so next we're going to move on to monitoring. So this changes a lot during the teen years. Long gone are the days of direct supervision. As teens go off and spend more time away, monitoring becomes more about talking about what is going on than actually being directly there supervising them. So if you're connected and involved in your teen's life, monitoring, monitoring becomes a whole lot easier. Positive relationships have trust. So your teen's going to be more willing to share important information, such as what they're doing, where they're going, who they're with, so having that positive relationship, it's important to know who they're with, where they're going, what they're doing. Don't forget the teenage brain is still developing. So teens may be more prone to impulsive and risky behavior, which is why they need a safe sounding board and your advice and support. So how do we monitor a teen? That's an interesting area. Well, as we said, talk. We need to know who, where, and what. Get to know your child's friends. Give them a space in your home. Communicating with the parents of your children's friends can help create a safe environment for your child and his friends and help you keep track of them, right? Keep track of their activities. So when the boys are all hanging out, invite them into your home. Provide them food. You know, the other night the kids came into the house and we ordered them pizza and they had a great time and they start talking to you. And then the following week, another parent did that. So it's really important. Food really attracts them as well. So if you have some good food, you're likely to attract the friends and keep them close by, get to know them. Be aware of what your child is reading. If your teens are anything like mine, they're way ahead of me in the technology department. So that's why you need to talk to them. You need to know what they're reading, what they're watching on TV, what they're doing on the computer and internet. Big key factor, keep TVs and computers in shared areas. Too often there's TVs in the room and teens who need sleep are enticed by watching programs. So they actually don't go to sleep and they stay up way too late watching TV. And it's very hard to monitor what they're doing in their bedrooms. Keep those items in shared areas. It's very important. It's also a good idea to talk about how much screen time they should be having each day. So this is a discussion and a decision that you should be having with your team. So you want to still set clear limits and expectations. Uh, I, believe it or not, these give teens a sense of security, structure, and predictability. This should be done together. You should talk about them together. Discuss appropriate behaviors and discuss consequences for poor choices. Agreed on rules help your teen know what standards apply in your family and what will happen if they are broken. So if you set up expectations when your child is young, they will have these expectations as they get older. So for example, um, your daughter will be more likely to accept, ex uh, accept that she needs to tell you who, where, and what if it's always been a standard in your home. So she'll get in the habit of sharing this information. So what you want to do is also negotiate rules and responsibilities together. You need to have clear, reasonable boundaries. So rules need to be agreed upon ahead of time. Your team needs to know the rules and what will happen if they're broken. It's essential to involve them in working out limits. If your team feels that they're listened to and can contribute, they'll be more likely to see you as fair and stick to the agreed rules. And be sure you follow through on consequences. And what you can do is start off small. So try with uh, small liberties and increase as they are meeting those expectations and following the rules 
and responsibilities. So it's not static. Obviously, as your child is 11, 12, once they become 13 and 14, you're going to grow and they're going to demonstrate more responsibility. So then you can give them more latitude and negotiate that with them. So we're just going to go on to the next slide with regards to a tool that we use with teens about monitoring. It's called planning ahead. It's a planning ahead tool with your team. So really what we want to do is have that situation. So your team comes to you with regards to wanting to go to a concert. It's their first concert and you have some real concerns. You have some real concerns about how they're going to get there and how they're going to get home. So you want to talk about all your concerns. And then you want to have the what if conversation. So often teens aren't thinking that far ahead. So what if they get separated from their friends? What would they do? What if it could be something even more serious? What if the driver of the vehicle has been drinking? What are you going to do? So it's very important to have these what if conversations, even if your teen is sort of telling you that, oh, nothing's going to happen, everything's going to be fine. It helps both you and your teen understand the situation. You want to encourage after the what if conversation, you want to encourage some brainstorming and problem solving. And you want to be um, honest with them with regards to what some of the options are. And listen to your adolescent, listen to them, listen for their suggestions. Once they know what your concerns are, you can come up with some solutions together. It's reasonable for, for you to expect them to know what to do in the event of a problem. So um, to continue on that and then agree upon the decision. Agree and commit to follow the plan. So if they're committed to being home at a certain time, everybody is in agreement to, to following the plan. And then after, after the event or the concert, if, if everything works well with your planning ahead tool and you feel comfortable and you both agreed upon it, you want to the next day or that evening follow up to see how things went. Was there anything that was unexpected? What could you do in that situation? So keep that conversation going. So next we're moving on to role modeling. This one's fairly simple. As you can see in the car, the woman's driving with her phone. So it's just a very clear example that kids are watching you. Children are more apt to do as you do than as you say. So what you do shows your child how you want them to behave. So if you, how you cope with feelings such as frustration or, and distress, this all influences how your teen's going to handle their emotions. They're also watching you with regards to how you lead a healthy lifestyle. And this will also influence your children. So it's important to also take care of yourself. What you say is also important. You can help your team to manage and control his own behavior by talking about how behavior affects other people. I like this quote by James Baldwin. It says, children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. So it just really hits home how important the actions that you do are for their development. So how to be a good role model, aside from your actions, do as you say. So teens can notice when you don't. For example, if you're telling you want your child to be truthful and tell me the truth, and then when there's a telephone, person, there's a solicitor on the telephone, and you're telling your child, to say, oh no, I'm not home, tell them I'm not home. So ensure that you, uh, what you are saying matches your words and actions as well. Um, often we want our teens to limit their technology, but all too often we see parents bringing their phones to the table, even if it's something important for work, it really should, we really should have no technology at the table. And that's for parents and kids. Speak to your teen in a way that you want to be spoken to. As adults, showing that you can keep your cool even in challenging circumstances is very beneficial. Getting upset or angry when a problem comes up only encourages your child to act the same way. Find ways to use problem solving to deal with those challenges and conflicts in a calm and productive way. When you make a commitment, you want to keep them and then encourage your teen to do the same. If you're going to say you're going to spend time with them or you're going to be home at a certain time, um, and something else comes up, if, it, if it's not crucial, keep your commitment to your children. 
admit when you're wrong. This is something that we should role model for our children a lot more than we actually do. Take responsibility for yourself. Admit your own mistakes and talk about how you can correct them. Try not to blame everything that goes wrong on other people. You know, asking for forgiveness is an important lesson to learn. So also recognize efforts. It's easy to be happy when everything goes well. It's about demonstrating behaviors when not successful and praising efforts and resiliency. So you want to show kindness and respect to others. Your, no, your youth is going to notice how you speak to the waitress. They're going to notice how you react with a, a cashier who's maybe a little bit slow, or certainly the driver in front of you that just cut you off. So meeting those types of situations with patience and maybe a good dose of humor will encourage your child to do the same. You want to make healthy life choices. So what you eat, what you drink, your physical activity, are you interested in community volunteering? How well do you manage stress? So really making those healthy choices will help them make those healthy choices as well. And at the end, the last point here is to be positive. To really think, act, and live out with a positive outlook. Be accepting of others' differences. Show kindness and respect. You know, you can even ask yourself with regards to some self-reflection questions. Do I put myself down? Do I put other people down? Do I refuse to apologize when it's appropriate? Do I show respect for people, even those whose thoughts are different than mine? So it's really important to have that positive outlook when you're role modeling to your teens. Okay, and now we're going to sum up the fifth parenting action because this is a good parenting support is really the foundation for all the actions. So support is really accepting your teen for who they are. Taking your child's opinion seriously, giving them, that gives them a very important boost in their self-esteem. Be prepared that your teen's views might differ from yours. So now they're sort of developing into their own independent person and they might not actually have all the same views as you and that can be very very difficult as a parent. Talk about how, off, how, how people often have different perspectives and that's okay. Talking about your own opinion and feelings calmly can also help to keep the lines of communication open and model, model positive ways of relating to others. Support will look different for everyone and it might change from day to day. No two parents show love in quite the same way. So tap into your own way on how you show kids that you care. Don't try and live up to some stereotype way of showing support. Just really do what works for you. Sometimes that could mean communicating in a way that works for your family. So it could simply just be a text that works for you. Often teens really like to communicate through text message. So you can sort of have some little symbols and signs that you can show your support through that. Show affection in whatever way you're both comfortable with. So how to provide support? Well, this is kind of just highlighting what we've talked about tonight. Listen and respect your team. Acknowledge their feelings. Support them even when it's difficult. Even if you disagree, kids need to know that they st still belong. Try to tune into your child's feelings. The emotional brain is ruling their head right now, so help them, work emotion, help them work through emotional outbursts. This is a great way to help them develop positive coping skills. As parents, we may downplay disappointment with not making a goal or making the team or personal situations with friends, but acknowledging their feelings, being empathetic and compassionate will give the message that their feelings are heard and that you are someone that they can count on. So it's not only their friends they can turn to, they can turn to you for support. Being supportive is also staying alert to signs that your teen may be struggling. So we talked earlier about normal teenage behaviors, but we also need to be in tune if their struggles go beyond what's normal. So a lot of people, when it's their first time, they're sort of a little confused on what is normal. Is this normal or is it beyond? Also encourage your teen to talk to a trusted adult about their problems. So it's very important, these are part of the developmental assets, that your team be connected to at least three other adults in their lives. They may not be comfortable talking to you, but it's important that they have trusted adults in their life 
So if you have friends, make sure that your teens are connected with them, that they feel comfortable with them. It could be a coach, a neighbor, a teacher, a family friend, aunts and uncles. There's lots of other teens that should be actively involved in their life. Encourage your youth to ask for help. Send the message very clearly that it's okay to ask for help. You can go online and get resources. So at the bottom, the Youth Services card, I put the link in here so that you can check that out at your own leisure. But these are all important, mess, uh, all important numbers and programs that kids who are having a little bit more difficult time can access. So that's for you later on. So when I mention how to know the difference and how to know when to ask for help, we're just going to take a few minutes to watch. It's a three minute video and it really explains clearly to know when it's beyond normal behavior and when you think you should ask for outside help. Parents of adolescents always often ask us, how can we really differentiate what's normal or typical for an adolescent versus what these might be the signs of a mental health concern? And this is a very common question, particularly during adolescence where there's so much happening, there's so many changes that are taking place. I think, again, the first thing here is you're looking for a significant change in mood, behavior, or thinking that's affecting one or more aspects of their life. So, for example, uh, it's not having a bad test, but all marks just start spiraling downwards. Physical appearance may take a, a significant change. Uh, sleeping patterns change normally during adolescence, uh, but if your adolescent is, is uh, really having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, staying awake throughout the day, and again, for week on and week out, this could be the sign of something that's, that's more significant. Uh, we see in terms of behavior towards others, probably the most significant one from a mood disorder side would be when they start to pull away from friends or pull away from activities that they previously enjoyed. Uh, in terms of the behavioral side of things, some risk-taking behavior is normal. It's typical for adolescents. Actually, it's the adolescent that shows no risk-taking behavior at all that might be a sign of someone that's a little over control. When the risk-taking behavior is not typical. It is more frequent, occupying more and more of a child's, uh, the young person's uh, time. Uh, might be placing them or, the, or others at risk for self-harm or harm to others. Uh, that's really what you have to watch out that this might be uh, beyond what would be uh, typical for an adolescent. Probably the biggest warning side is when friends start telling you that they're concerned about your son or daughter. Uh, they see your son or daughter uh, probably more often than you do these days. They might be in the best position to notice a change in behavior, mood, and feelings. And they may have some real concerns about what might be going on. Similarly, they may be the best people to help bridge your son or daughter to appropriate services, even just to find out if they're okay. Okay, so that just was a, a brief overview of some of the things you can look for. And the resources are also on that link. So, and Cheryl will talk about some more resources. So just to sum up those five parenting actions, why is it important to do these five parenting actions? Well, it's really about building that strong relationship. As we stated earlier, the, your relationship with your teen is going to be the best predictor for positive outcomes. So there's no secret to this, it's all about the relationship. So when I also say relationship, I don't mean friendship, so I hope that was clear. It's about having that positive, respectful relationship with open communication. It's not being their best friend, but it's being you know, connected and involved and infusing your values and your beliefs in there as well, still setting limits, but having everybody involved in that. So youth who come from strong from families with strong relationships they become more responsible resilient and they're better able to adapt to different and complicated situations they also provide positive mental health this means strong self-esteem self-acceptance self-regulation you know that being able to say no and in today's society when anxiety is at an all-time high it's really important for youth to be resilient and to bounce back and be able to cope it helps them develop strong decision making and problem solving. So this is going to be key when faced with the enticement of risky behavior. So these parenting actions are going to help reduce high risk behaviors 
high risk behaviors such as drinking, drugs, dangerous situations, and aggression. So I'm going to now pass it along to Cheryl. Thanks, Cynthia. That was great. Um, so if you think back when I was first um, speaking about all the changes that adolescents are going through, those physical, emotional, intellectual changes, and so much is happening. And and um, in addition to that, that they're going through during um, adolescence, they're also having another huge change, which is the um, transition from elementary school to high school. And this can be a really exciting time, but it can also be a very scary and stressful time for both you and your, your teen. Some of the things that teens often are thinking about when they're starting high school are adapting to their new environment, um, so they are worried about things like, what if I can't find my locker? What if I'm late for class? Um, what if I can't make any new friends? So a lot of kids are worried about sort of fitting in. They're worried about drifting away from old friends. They maybe have heard stories about um, the heavier workload and all the extra tests and assignments and exams and how the teachers might not be as nice. So they're worried about all these kinds of things. They may have been playing sports in grade eight and they've been on the team and they've um, been one of the best players and now they have to go and try out for a team with all these bigger, better players. So lots of things going on in the mind of these teens and they may not be talking openly about their concerns. So um, because of everything they're going through, they need extra support from their parents as, as they're tra transitioning into high school. So our kids network um, recognize that parents need and teens need extra support through this transition time. And if you're not familiar with our kids network, it's a community collaboration. It's all Halton agencies that support children and families. And there's a transition subcommittee and what we did was look at the existing research in this area and we performed a stakeholder survey and identified that parents really are looking for supports during this time um, because it is such a, a stressful um, change, but they're not always sure of where to go to get these supports and what exactly is available to them. So our Kids Network developed this new resource called Ready, Set, Woe and um, a package was developed for parents of all grade 8 students and this package was sent out to all grade 8 families last year in October and November through the schools. So if you have a, a child entering grade 8 this year um, in October or November you'll receive this package of information with lots of resources and um, tips to help prepare your child and yourself for that transition into high school. And we also developed a web page to help support parents through this transition period as well. So it's currently housed on the haltonparents.ca website. So I'll just give a little demonstration of what we have on our site. So if you go to haltonparents.ca, um, you'll see all the Halton Parents resources that are available and they've been organized by the age and stage of your child. So if you have a younger child, a toddler, a preschooler, you would click on this section and access all the um, great information and resources there. If you have a younger child um, and the Ready, Set, Woe, you can get to through the teen page, um, which I'll come back to in a second, but I'll just scroll down here and you'll see Ready, Set, Woe. So you can get to it through this page. Um, just a quick um, aside about, you might see Kindergarten Ready, Set, Go here. That's another resource that was developed a few years ago um, by also by our Kids Network because we know that the transition to kindergarten is another huge transition for children and their parents. So this resource was provided and developed to um, support parents. So when we were thinking about what to name um, this resource, we wanted to keep it fairly consistent with a kindergarten ready, set, go. So we were thinking, what are parents thinking at this stage of their life? We're thinking, ready, let's get ready, let's get set, but whoa, just wait, slow down. I'm not sure that I'm ready for my child to start high school. 
I'm not sure if they're ready to start high school. I'm not really sure anything about the high school. I'm very comfortable with the elementary school. So that's where the name came from. So if we go back up to the teen section, we can click on there and we'll see lots of blogs um, that are written for parents that have teenagers. A lot of these blogs were written by Cynthia. And um, if you scroll down, you'll also see lots of the topics that parents are interested in um, finding more information and resources for when it comes to their teens, things like growth and development, healthy choices, alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, healthy minds. And then we have Ready, Set, Woe here at the bottom. So if we click on Ready, Set, Woe, we'll see more blogs that are written specifically for that transition to high school period. Uh, we also have a direct link to the Dr. Jean Clinton video on um, parenting your 10 to 16 year old and um, that's what I mentioned earlier. And then if we scroll down there are various sections. So there are important dates during the school year and in this section you'll find um, different school board calendars, a multi-faith calendar, just to give you an idea of kind of what kinds of things are happening during the school year. And then there's a section on understanding your teen. So lots more information and resources on how to understand what your teen is going through and how you can support your teen through the, the, those changes. And then there is information on developmental assets. Um, which again was developed by the Search Institute, but we're, um, we've worked hard to share that asset building message here in Halton. And there are some specific tips here on, on the website to help you build assets in your team so that they have more um, success and are more likely to thrive. And then going down the page is resources for enhancing school success. So these are all the school board um, parent pages and tips for supporting parents at your child's school. All those um, resources that parents are interested in like My Blueprint and Pathways. And then there's a section on community supports which is broken down to school board, community services, and teens with special needs. And you can see that there are lots of agencies and services that are available to help through this transition period. And so this is kind of a one-stop shop of knowing um, where you can go to find any of these services. And at the bottom is resources for schools and service providers so that they have information so that they're able to support parents. So again, um, if you're not able to find what you're looking for on our web pages, you're welcome to contact us through our other um, sites. So we'll just go back to the PowerPoint. And we'll leave with um, all the Halton, Halton parents' contact information. So you can contact a public health nurse directly by dialing 911, or sorry, 311. Don't dial 911. So call 311. Um, you can email us directly at haltonparents at halton.ca. You can visit our website, which is haltonparents.ca. Um, you can also read any of our blogs or comment on our blogs through haltonparentsblog.org. I'm sorry, it's cut off on my screen. Um, and then there's also our Twitter. You can follow us on Twitter. You can visit our Facebook page. And I've also listed the Halton Catholic District School Board parent pages um, on here as resources because it's a great resource for parents. So at this time, um, Cynthia and I would love to thank you for joining us tonight. And we'd like to open it up for any questions that you may have on any of the information that we um, shared tonight. Thank you, um, Cynthia. Um, uh, we do have one question on the line here. Uh, there was no mention of the issues related to video games and their effect um, on the present on the presentation or in the web pages. Can you speak to that? Um, sure. So, what parents often don't pay a lot of attention to is the rating on the games. A lot of the violent games are are rated M. And so they should be for mature content. So actually 
teens and preteens should not be playing them. Now, having said that, I know that uh, they are playing them and it's very difficult. Um, so there is, you know, with regards to setting that relationship and having that discussion on what your values are and whether or not you feel it's appropriate, whether or not you feel that your child is mature enough to be playing video games. But essentially, most of the violent games are rated above and beyond, so if that's what we're talking about. But if we're just talking about general video games um, with regards to, you know, Super Mario, Mario or, or something that is uh, rated G for general, then you would really have your family discussion on how much screen time. So video games would be included in screen time. And I think as a parent, you should look at, uh, you know, the benefits with regards to what games they're playing. So monitoring what they're playing, what they're allowed to play in your home. Um, I'm not really sure exactly if there was a specific issue with regards to the video games, but there is um, a lot of research with regards to um, looking at the effects of the, the video games. And there's still sort of, I think with regards to relationship and having that positive relationship, um, there's a lot more factors in violent behavior than just the video games, but essentially those violent video games really should be monitored and as an M they shouldn't really, they shouldn't be playing them. Okay, thank you. Um, we have no additional questions on the line. I'll turn it back to Josh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barb. Um, Everybody on the screen can see the email and the web pages um, to get the information. And I think sometimes people don't have questions because they have all the links to go to to get the information. Uh, thank you, Cheryl and Cynthia, for this excellent webinar. Um, as a parent of a teenager who I sometimes don't understand, this has been very informative. And um, I, it will certainly help many people out there tonight or those who are viewing it on their YouTube page at a later date when they need help understanding their teens. To everybody listening in, this webinar will join our previous webinars on our YouTube page under Halt and CPIC. So just type in YouTube, and when you get there, just in the search bar, type in Halt and CPIC, and all our webinars will show up. Just in case any of you wanted your friends or family to hear this presentation, you can make them aware of it. This was the last webinar for this year. We're already planning them for the fall, so please look for information on that at the beginning of the school year. On behalf of everybody at um, Halton Seabick, especially Rosemary and Barb that joined me tonight, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight and have a great rest of the evening and have a great summer. Thank you and good night. Is that it? That's yep. it. Yay. Okay, stop.